It's just plain exoticism, an interest in what's different, a kind of emotional excitement, something you feel in the presence of something strange and perhaps a bit repugnant to you. Recovering, passing the movie on Netflix. Let's talk about it. Pardon me, I don't mean to stare, but I think I know you. Claire? Mm -hmm. Isn't she extraordinarily beautiful? I suppose. Your life is perfect. Have you ever thought of what you'd do if John found out? I'd do what I want more than anything right now. I'd come up here to live with you. I think they'd be satisfied being white. Who's satisfied being anything? Let's get a movie. What was we gonna <laughs> say here? <laughs> Let's get a movie. <laughs> I concur. Let's get into it. Hey y'all, this is Kari. And this is Alexis. And you're listening to Lit Society, a show about books and drama. But we're switching it up today for our bonus episode where we're discussing what are we discussing, Alexis? Passing. Yeah, the movie on Netflix directed by Rebecca Hall. How many times have you watched this movie? Um, Two and a half. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, twice for me. What did you think of it? Like a full on. Yeah. Well, I um, I enjoyed it. I, in fact, I got to say I was mesmerized by this movie. Mm hmm. I was really drawn in by, can I say cinematography? Is that what it is? Or is it the directing? I, I don't know what category what I was seeing and feeling falls in. That's why I, I, I'm not sure what it, which one it is, but I really loved the, um, the way it was captured. How yeah. About you? Yeah. I think that's a very like on point response. Our expertise is not movies. So mm -mm. we just loved what we saw on screen. The artfulness of it. Was that mm -hmm. the director's choice? Is there a cinematographer behind that? I mean, the cinematographer has to follow the direction of the director. So okay. kudos to everybody involved. It was it was not what I expected. What did you think? Like, was it what you were expecting? Well, I, I guess I can say I would like to have seen um, the interaction with Claire, what's her name, Gertrude and Rini mm -hmm. when the husband came in. I would have liked to have seen that scene versus the way they cut that. Is that is that not what you meant? Well, no, I think that's fair. So they're, they're, it's movies are more economical. So some characters right. from the book are not going to be in the movie. And Gertrude was like um, a character that you will remember from the book, even though she's got a flash in the pan scene. It's yeah. like, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's memorable. So no, I get that. So you would have liked to see how Irene and Gertrude interacted. Yeah. Yeah. To see that bounce off and how he was saying um, the disgusting things that he was saying, I would have loved to have seen it with the three of them. But one more person in the room. One more person mm -hmm. in the room, but to see um, Claire looking at Rini the way she did, Mm, that was something. So that brings us to the acting. Very well done, I thought, anyway. They really embraced the characters and made them different from what I expected in the book. But I was still satisfied with what um, oh. Thompson and Nega uh, gave us. Um, I would have liked in that scene that you're talking about with Gertrude. And we'll get into like a deep dive of the movie um, or at least discussing more of the details. But I would have liked to see the bellhop or the um, the staff worker that came in, his reaction to what John was saying. You remember that scene? Oh, yeah, yeah. That would have been the perfect third party for me. Um, someone mm -hmm. who couldn't pass uh, was the staff worker. And I want to know what he thought of, you know, the disgusting things John was saying. So mm -hmm. I would have liked at least a facial expression, but... We'll get into it. And then lastly, what did you think of the choice to remove color from a film about passing racially? So I have a couple of thoughts about that. <laughs> to me, they look like black women. So I, I don't think that would have been as believable in a non-black and white setting. I think it ah. needed to be black and white. So that was just my thought on that. I really appreciated the black and white um, angle of it. I, I enjoyed it. To have seen it in color, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it would have um, had been so impactful on me if it had been in color. 
Twitter was definitely up in arms a little bit about could uh, Tessa Thompson and could Ruth Nega pass. But is that the point? Like, I I really didn't get involved in that discussion because to me it was irrelevant. Um, I Mm -hmm. do think, though, oddly enough, Ruth Nega passes more in color than she did in black and white. In black and white, she clearly looks like a black woman to me. But Uh in color and just life, I could totally see how she could pass as a white woman. And she's Irish and Ethiopian. Um, Mm -hmm. So they're both of mixed race. Everyone involved um, from Rebecca Hall to Tessa Thompson to Ruth Nega are are mixed race women in some way. Um, Or and and when you say mixed race, are you mean immediate appearance or do you mean descendant of? Well, let's get into it. Number one category. (laughs) (laughs) Director and cast. So let's talk about the director, Rebecca Hall. Uh, Did you know her before this movie? Okay, so somebody, uh, maybe you did. You told me that she was in a movie that I watched, but she doesn't stand out to me. So Mm. I'm going to say, no, I don't know her. Okay. so Even if she is in a movie I watched, I don't know her. She's in a a few, a couple period pieces. I think they're um, miniseries that I can think of. But what stands out in my mind the most is actually The Prestige, where she plays um, Christian Bale's wife. Um, Mm. And I thought she did a brilliant job. And I've seen her since then. Of course, she's even developed more as an actor. Um, So I I already whenever I see her in a movie, I think this is going to be a good movie because everything I've seen her in has been very dramatic, almost theatrical. um, And she carries those roles well, usually like period pieces because she has a very posh accent. Um, Well, she was born May 3rd, 1982 in London. She's the daughter of an American opera singer um, named Maria Ewing, Ewing, I think, um, and an English stage director. And she grew up with like a very um, posh life. Her mom's from Detroit, Michigan. um, But Rebecca Hall's upbringing was very like upper class English. And people would often call her mother exotic. Oh, your mom looks so exotic. Mm. And as a kid, you like, that's my mama. That's not a bird. So no doubt <laughs> that made her feel, you know, some people are fine with the title exotic. But when you hear it over and over again about your mom, wh- you might think like, wh- what about my mom is so different to you? Mm. So um, growing up with her mom, she would ask questions sometimes. They were watching um, <laughs> we've talked about this movie before, Imitation of Life. You've seen that, right? A billion and ten times. <laughs> yeah. So they would watch it and she would ask her mom certain questions and her mom would be like, you know, I don't know. Maybe we're black. Maybe we're Indian, whatever. Um, and then it would be dropped. Well, Rebecca says, and this is a quote, before I read this book 13 years ago, I didn't have a word for what my own grandfather did. And then she explains that passing is, and I quote, passing on a legacy of denial. So Mm. it seems to be that her grandfather was mixed race. If you look at photos of her mother um, today compared to like when she was younger, I've seen some younger photos. And to me, she clearly looks like a a black American woman. Um, Her mother. Yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. And as time passes, her look gets more ambiguous. Um, Mm. So that's that's what I mean as far as mixed race for Rebecca Hall. It doesn't it seems like her grandfather was of mixed race and her mother uh, lived as a white woman. And uh, even you said she looked like a black woman in the in her younger years. But today yeah. I would say she looks different. She does oh, look okay. different to me. Okay. Yeah. And and people, of course, were concerned about Rebecca Hall directing this story, writing oh. this screenplay. Um, Can you understand that? What do you think before knowing her story? Well, I white people are always telling black people's stories so that that's not surprising. Yeah, that's what I would initially say. It wouldn't surprise me Mm -hmm. because it happens all the time. And I say that because I immediately think of the um, color purple. No, Uh. not that. I was thinking of a book and particularly the uh, number one ladies detective agency where you were, you know, You talked about that. So that stands out to me immediately (laughs) because of that. So can I clarify that book bothers me because you are filling an entire world with people whose lives you don't know. 
Um, if we take a movie, though, like The Color Purple, for example, the source material for that is Alice Walker's book, The Color Purple. And although the director is Steven Spielberg, he's not creating the source material, the, the screenplay is adapted from a book. So, right. and I mean, that movie's brilliant, but Rebecca Hall writing out the um, screenplay, I could see why some people might question that at first. Like, and, uh, and what gives you the right? <laughs> yeah. And that's my, and that's my thought. She is in, from first sight, a white woman Telling the story of a, a um, you know, a passing, but you know she could have that history. So and she does. Who knows what people? Yeah. Have, so I don't. I didn't think anything of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, she mentioned to someone that she may be of mixed race, and they handed her passing by Nella Larson, <laughs> like thirteen years ago, <laughs> like we said. Um, and she says that the book gave her a framework to address her own racial identity. And I can imagine that you're growing up in this upper class English society, and your mom is from Detroit, Michigan, and saying things like, "We might be black," and you're like, "Wait, what does that mean?" And in the context of everything that being black American means, where do I fit in? Well, she finished the book and immediately began writing a screenplay 10 days after reading it. She like put the book down and was hammering away. And she says as an actor, she always approached her roles from the director's point of view. She would like cut the film in her head. So transitioning from actor to director uh, was a natural like evolution for her. Um, She gave uh, Ruth the option to play either Irene or Claire. Isn't that interesting? So that's one of the first cast members she had a meeting with. How how do you think Ruth Nega would have done in the role of Irene? Interesting. Right. Oh, that would be a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. And if Ruth is Irene, is is Tessa Claire? (laughs) I I think these women are both strong enough to play either role. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that way. One thing Rebecca says is that they're completely different characters, Irene and Claire, but they have to contain the other one within their character. And that's a great point. They they both came virtually from the same place, but they've made different decisions. And so they could be in each other's position easily, easily. off of one decision had they uh, went a different route. Um, yeah. So that I thought that was really interesting. And then the beauty of black and white, Ruth says, is that it's not black and white. It's gray. Ooh, I like <laughs> that. I, I like, like that. Okay. Yes, this film is about absolutely. (laughs) It's all about um, characterizations and categories um, that society puts you in, but life is often more gray than black and white. Um, Mm -hmm. So that was a purposeful choice. And on the film being shot in four by three, she says, "I literally put them in a box." Isn't that cool? Oh, I don't know what I don't know what that means. What does it ah, mean? Okay, it's not a widescreen film. It's more square. Okay, and mm-hmm. I, I never quite understood what that was, so forgive me. But mm-hmm. I, I I don't. But when you say in a box, I understand they're working in a smaller space. It's not all encompassing area. Is mm-hmm. that what you mean? Okay, and then it's also yeah yeah no I can okay. see that too. Um, and it's also more of a square, more of a box shape. And that's also on purpose because it's emphasizing how they feel confined by like societal expectations and the role each character plays in their life. So she on purpose, thoughtfully made the movie black and white and more box like to emphasize like the, the category we put people in. But I love that that bla- the beauty of black and white is that it's not black and white. It's gray. Mm-hmm. So now we're going to go into some questions about the uh, cast um, and, and the movie in general. I want to ask you, Alexis, what is this movie about? Good grief. Um, I guess you can say the movie is uh, about those categories overall. Right. So mm-hmm. you have passing and then where do, where do you fit within the entire scheme of things? You're finding your place within um, the world, the box the world puts you in Mm -hmm. and being comfortable with it. One of the quotes that sticks with me the most is that motherhood, what is the saying? What is it that she says? 
Claire makes a surprise visit to Irene's house and they're sitting on the couch basically saying how motherhood is like one of the most evil things a woman can go through. And I'm paraphrasing. Um, But this comes from both of them handling their roles as women, as mothers and as wives differently. Um, And these aren't roles that they necessarily chose for themselves. These are roles that society chose for them and they had to get in where they fit in. It ain't like they had a lot of options as far as who they would become and what kind of lives they would lead at this time. And neither did Nella Larson, uh, the writer of Passing. Okay, so how did Rebecca Hall settle on this casting? Like we said before, she met with uh, Ruth Nega um, and then she gave Ruth the opportunity to choose either um, role, either Irene or Claire, and she set everyone up around that. So are these roles a diversion, you think, from uh, Ruth um, and Tessa's characters that they usually play? Do you know them from any other works? Yeah, so the first time I saw um, Ruth is probably this year, 2021, when I watched Loving. I forgot about that movie. You know, I yeah. begrudgingly watched that and ended up loving it because I thought <laughs> yeah, it would be it this a great movie. I thought it would have this cheesy message about how, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I thought, but no. um, it wasn't it was a love story. And I, I felt really touched by both of their portrayals. You're right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She was standout in that movie. And um, so I that was the first time I met her. It just so happens to have been earlier this year that I watched that. And then Tessa, I've seen Tessa and plenty of stuff. Um, I can't think of the first thing I saw her in, but um, I, I think the most recent thing I saw her in is Sylvie's Love. So I don't think it's out of uh, character for either of them to play those dramatic roles. I will say for Tessa Thompson, I've never seen her be this vulnerable and insecure and unsure in a character. Um, so that was really interesting to me because I picture her as more of a stronger, like um, almost like I'm probably associating her char- all of her characters too closely to one Marvel character. So to oh. me, she's like a warrior. And to see her be the weak one in a lot of ways was fun. Um, oh. I thought she did a great job with that. So did you see her in um, Sylvie's Love? No. Okay. And Carrie Washington directed that, right? With her old mm. ugly husband in it. He's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> he's like one of, he's the love interest, right? Carrie Washington. Yeah, he's the love interest husband. in that movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, no, yeah. I haven't seen it. Um, and then I think she was in um, for the Colored Girls. I just can't remember what role she played. I don't, she wasn't, I don't think she was one of the primary colored the primary characters, but <laughs> I do remember her from that. Okay. As well. Okay. So what, uh, who else could have played these characters? Not, and we're, and we're um, completely satisfied with the actors who played these characters, but who else perhaps could have taken on that role or would we have liked to see in that role? And so for Irene, I don't think you, you have anyone, right? You think only Tess, you can only see Tessa in this role. Yeah. Tessa did so well. I just, mm-hmm. I just I would, love Tessa in the role. I would love to see Rebecca Hall in it. While, oh. while, um, because she's she's white presenting. She looks white. She is white. Um, but I would like to see her as a white woman that society has denied the ability to live completely as a white woman. So truthfully, during that time, if they knew her grandfather was of mixed race then she black to everybody so she would be pushed into a black life and she looks white so I -hmm. I would like to see on her face that kind of like denial and um contradiction yeah you've uh, so seen her in that role so you probably could slice her in there yeah maybe yeah I could see that yeah I've seen her uh, range a little bit more so what about Claire is there anyone you could think for Claire outside of Ruth Nega she just played it so well. It's hard to say. Yeah. Well, um, I would like Alicia Keys in it because ever since we met Alicia, we've known she's of mixed race and she's always presented herself um, with whether it be her braids or her hairstyle mm-hmm. or the soulful music, the way she sings, what she sings about. So to see her presenting herself as a white woman would be so jarring um, that I, I'd want to see her reach that, you know, that out of character character you know what I mean I I'd I'd be like pleasantly shocked 
to okay. see her play somebody. So mm-hmm. I hadn't thought outside of that at all, but I have seen Mariah in some really good roles. Could she fill in any one of these roles? Yeah, she could fill them all because she goes all in. Okay, acting chops underrated, Mariah Carey. Mariah could be Brian. Okay, Mariah can act. I don't know why (laughs) y'all tripping on Mariah. (laughs) Yeah, I've seen her in some solid dramatic roles. And I would say she would deserve a chance if anybody else would deserve a chance. If you're looking at musicians as well. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Because some musicians can cross over into the uh, theater, the stage. Mm -hmm. Um, And y'all didn't know how much um, Alexis loves glitter. Okay, what about (laughs) Brian? That don't count. That don't count. Is there justice for glitter? Is there anyone you can see playing the role of Brian? Listen, listen. I don't know many black actors other than Idris Elba, so I can't I can't even comment on this. That's an insane statement. Okay, I love it. Go ahead. (laughs) That's all I got to say about that. Well, I would love to see (laughs) Tyler Perry because Wow. I want to see these women passing in front of a man that has made his career in real life, um, you know, in wigs and dresses. And I want (laughs) to think to myself, what is Brian doing? And Claire's and Irene's closet was she not home? No, you that looking for a comedy? That has another layer. <laughs> you looking for a comedy? Stop. And it. actually, everything I've seen Tyler Perry acting um, outside of his own um, things sometimes, he's like been a pleasant surprise. I'm always like, mm-hmm. hey, that's Tyler Perry. I don't know if that means he's a great actor, but it makes me smile when I see him and stuff. Anyway, I think he let's does move a good on. Job. <laughs> Okay, and what about John Bellew? Because I guess this actor that plays him is an up and coming actor that people love. They really yeah. loved him. They hated to see him as a racist man. Who else do you think could play that part? Okay. Um Oh, so immediately I <laughs> <laughs> think of a really great racist, not in real life cuz I don't know them, Liam. but on the screen, yes. Liam Neeson. No, no. <laughs> Who are you going to say? I'm sorry. I was going to say Leonardo DiCaprio. Yes, Alexis, that was my pick. Yeah. That's my pick. Really great okay. Wait, <laughs> we both chose Leonardo DiCaprio for John. Now, everyone who knows the actor that plays John, I know he's great. Don't he come is. for us. I don't know him from anything, but I know Leonardo. So tell me why you would love Leonardo in this role. Um, I have seen Leonardo play that I'm better than you kind of mm-hmm. role. Yes. yes. And he just does a really good job at it. That's that's that. And so I feel like he could slide into this role really well. Okay. <laughs> he could do that really well. So my notes say Leonardo DiCaprio, because I buy that he's privileged, rich and obtuse about his own wife. Mm -hmm. We love to see it. I love that. I love the way you say that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Absolutely. That's very fitting. (laughs) All right. Well, let's move on to standout moments. Do you have five favorite scenes from this movie that you could share with us? Yeah. Well, I think I have four, maybe. Let's see. Let's see what I can come up with for you today yeah so um the stare down it's brilliant (laughs) right okay so why do you love that scene so you this is interesting to me because it made rainy feel uncomfortable to me in the movie rainy was not as um comfortable passing she wasn't comfortable passing she seemed to look down she didn't want anybody looking directly at her and the idea that this woman was staring at her so hard that she got up like she was going to race out of the scene before like this she woman was caught running her out away from a murderer being black <laughs> yes, yes. Mm-hmm. so I, that is something i did not expect at all um to happen i felt like she would be a lot more confident and she wasn't confidently passing. Mm-hmm. Oh, she wasn't confidently passing. That's a mouthful. I love that scene too, because first of all, I would love to have tea there and be the loud table. 
it was all boring. And and in the beginning of the movie, you don't know who's passing in front of the screen, whether they're white and black. All you hear is the mundane nature of everyone's life. And the fact that race has to now play into this um, is kind of um, ridiculous in a way because everyone has their things. And whether it be concern about war, safety, uh, whether familial concerns, everyone goes through that. So now adding in race just showed how ridiculous um, racism is. And then being in this beautiful setting where you got these two older ladies who aren't talking to each other and look like, you know, the bottom of an old shoe. Both of them just looking there, just sitting there looking stuffy. And then you got this man who's trying to, you know, talk to this woman. And then this woman just staring at you, standing out. Mm -hmm. Um, That was just brilliant. I thought that was a great, great scene. When (laughs) When Claire told her that she was she thought of Rini often she was like you have <laughs> <laughs> what you think of me for like why would you be <laughs> thinking of me that's weird mm-hmm. <laughs> she was like huh oh uh, well sure okay and that wasn't the only t- they were so <laughs> slight in their in the way they spoke to each other in their mannerisms and it was so effective um like there's a time when um Claire when Irene sighs and goes why because white people gonna be there when Claire's asking yeah, to go to the that. party <laughs> why because white people like you gonna be there <laughs> why you wanna go so yeah I love that too like you have mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. don't be thinking about me Okay. Like what? <laughs> when they laughed, I'm going to say at him for not knowing Claire was passing as a Negro. Mm, yeah, but was Claire's <laughs> laugh genuine? I feel like the only one laughing in, in the, that scene was Irene. In the the book, I feel like Cla- Irene's laugh wasn't genuine in the movie. I expected more laughter from her. Because it just didn't seem like it felt like a fake laugh to me. I felt like she could have laughed harder. Okay, like like a (laughs) girl, yeah, for real. Yes, Nick, Nick. (laughs) But she's a very demure person, so I felt like Irene's laugh was fitting for Irene. But I'm asking. So to me, only Irene is laughing in that moment. Claire's laugh wasn't genuine. What do you think? Claire Claire's laugh was. um, It wasn't a real laugh. I mean, it wasn't a lot of laugh either, but she was uncomfortable. She was she's uncomfortable. on stage. Whenever he's mm-hmm. in the room, she's on stage passing and but nothing she, she does is genuine. I think she enjoys being on that stage. Mm. She's a performer. <laughs> OK, when Brian <laughs> asked for some charity from his wife and she was worried about people seeing, I was like, this is ridiculous. You're in the car. And he touched your leg and you worried about somebody seeing. Yeah. Girl, stop it. You're yeah. doing too much. You you married. You married, girl. <laughs> and you too prim and proper. And so you, that's a favorite scene. You would go back <laughs> and watch that scene. It made me chuckle. Yes, I like to laugh. Okay. Is that OK? <laughs> Can I laugh? I can't. OK, yep. <laughs> So meanwhile, I'm going, oh, that's sad. And you going, ha, ha. <laughs> this is the greatest comedy I've ever seen. OK, go ahead. I what said, else you it's got? It's just so ridiculous. That's yeah. what it was. It was absolutely ridiculous. That lady was looking. She don't know what you're doing with your hands. You in a whole car. She wasn't thinking the about you. The one lady on the street. <laughs> the one lady on mm-hmm. the street. So I. that's my Top four. I, I I didn't get to, you know, I have a bad memory, but I have no. to, it takes me time to really pull things out and I wasn't able to pull up another one for you. No, so. I agree with your list. I had on mine um, when John walks in and says, Nick, because for me, everything from that moment changes so quickly. And the uneasiness that Claire and Irene felt for, for each other from the beginning turns into something like closer to fear, like it becomes dangerous. You know, it when was you, dangerous in that it moment. It was dangerous. Because you, yeah. I mean, at that moment, it's not like he knew he knew right then or he could identify. I mean, literally, Rini is never looking up when it's right. white people in the place. She's not. She's not giving them eye to eye right. contact at all. Mm-hmm. So, if we jump later into the me- movie where she comes face to face with him. That's the only time she looked him in the eye. Mm. So is she looking down while he's in that room 
Yes. At the hotel. Yes. She is. She because did when she laughing, she looking up. <laughs> she is looking up when she's laughing. Um, and she did look up when she asked him, so do you like um, Negroes? But that, to me, was like a her standing up for herself. That's what I mm. felt like that was. But overall, she's she's not looking people in the eye yeah. as, when she's passing. Mm, that's a great point. In the scene, too, when he gets home, we learn that Claire won't have any colored people near her, including a maid. And her husband takes this as like proof that she hates black people right. even more than he does. But as a watcher, we understand that she don't want to be found out. And mm-hmm. in the meantime, she's becoming obsessed with black culture and deprived of it. So she mm-hmm. thirsty. She thirsty for the water that is her culture. Mm-hmm. I thought that was interesting. And then I had um, Zoo and Claire enjoying the weather when Irene gets home. Yeah. There's something about that scene that's so normal. And it's a normal that that Irene don't know. Claire and Zoo are in the backyard chilling, being regular people. And Claire mm-hmm. is passing, but she's more relaxed with black people than Irene is. Mm-hmm. And Irene at, at Irene's own Negro League party, she spends the entire evening with Hugh. <laughs> you never see her engaged in anything close to intimacy with any black person. So right. I feel like that was just so such a delicate move to have them just sitting outside now we don't get a maid in the book that we know well so I thought the addition of Zoo um, was really cool and helped me to digest the characters even more so why did Zoo ignore her when she came in and asked because Zoo don't like Irene and I wouldn't either because Irene talked to her can I help you with something (laughs) that's another favorite (laughs) Can I help you? I said, Zoo. Okay, I'm going to get to that because I've actually, that's on my okay. list to talk about. Yeah, talk about as it a favorite there, quote. Because I need to know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I loved it. Because she I just ignored it. her. I mean, it was a lot of moments to like, I just, it was hard narrowing down five. So go ahead. <laughs> no, I love it. So yeah, Zoo don't like Irene. And I don't like Irene either when I'm with Zoo. Because Zoo seemed cool. She like, what's wrong with Zoo? Why are you talking to Zoo like this? And so why not let Zoo just enjoy the weather for two seconds? I don't know you sleep mm. all day Irene you sleep, you sleep all sleep day, all day. <laughs> your son came home and said mom are you going to bed again <laughs> okay why are you okay. sleeping all the time you what is going what? on mm-hmm. are you passing in that you don't want anybody to know you going through something what is Ooh, it I want to talk about that too okay, okay so Zoo and Claire enjoying the weather that's another favorite scene of mine I have Irene reading um, the book with her boys while the father tries to explain to them about lynching. And I looked it up and the book they're reading came out actually in 2007. So this is a little fun that the director is having. It's called Departure Time and it's by True Smatty. And it's the story um, of a girl who like is talking to these animals and at the same time, I think trying to find her father. And then those two stories Mm -hmm. slowly start to intertwine and come together in a surprising ending. So I think this was like a, a choice uh, where the director is pointing to the fact that these two women, their story is going to come together in a surprising ending. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to um, speculate a little bit there. And then I have Hugh um, talking down about Claire while Brian defends her. Mm, so you know yeah. what it's like to have a platonic guy friend that is in your corner, but just a plat- a friend, just having a friend that's in your corner and that's on your team without you asking them to pitch. They already at the base. I don't know nothing about baseball, but y'all know what I'm saying. <laughs> so Hugh is very observant and he is um, noticing that something about Claire bugs Irene. So he's just start dissing um, Claire. He like Claire's boring. Um, every time she here, she put on the show. She ain't even nothing special. And then Brian, Irene's husband, is like defending her. You know, since she isn't here to defend herself, Brian says. And Hugh goes, you will. Very chivalrous, chival- <laughs> chivalrous of you. Yeah, that I'm was sure. uh, interesting. Mm-hmm. And I think um, uh, Irene and, and Hugh have amazing chemistry as true confidants and friends. There's another time when Hugh um, sees her drop the teapot and he mm. goes, oh, I'm sorry, Irene, I must have pushed you. 
And this happens in the book, but to see it, to see him repeatedly come to her defense in that way and do all he can to not to help her not feel embarrassed. Mm-hmm. I just really like that. It warmed my heart. Um, yeah, he sees right away what what is going on, at least in her mind, between Claire and Brian. And he ain't missed a beat. He like Claire's boring. <laughs> and don't defend her, Brian. And um, uh, Irene is acting crazy because I bumped her. It's fine. <laughs> um, so I just really like that. And then the final party, of course, is um, my last favorite scene. Um, I want to recreate this party at my house. Like, mine is the women <laughs> fault. Uh, spoiler alert. Oh, we going to spoil the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you better add that at the beginning because. But um, have we spoiled it yet? No, we've been good. Okay, stop I listening. I said something. If, if you didn't beginning. watch the movie and you like, oh, my interest is uh, P-I-Q-U-E-D, then I want to say, baby, stop watch, stop listening, right, Alexis? Yeah, because I already said something already. I think that's a spoiler, but. Yeah, Y'all should have known that. how we do. Okay, so <laughs> uh, the party, right? Mm-hmm. I want to have this party at my house, minus the women falling from the window. <laughs> the music, <laughs> the clothing, everything. I was like, this is fabulous. I want this for me. And there's a part where the, a man, someone else's husband, approaches um, mm-hmm. Irene. Irene, yeah. Because she's looking out the window lost, feeling like, you know, her whole world about to be dissolved because of Claire. And he comes up to her and he says, come talk to me or at least listen to me gavel. And I love that. I love when there's someone at the party that's going to make sure no one is sitting alone. You know what I mean? I too love that person. I love that person. I do. Yeah. And he wasn't flirty or inappropriate. Mm -mm. He's saying, "Uh uh-uh, we over here. You come be with us. Yeah. And some about that just reminded me of a few people I know. I was like, "Mm, I just, I need to have this party. But anyway, during this scene, we're completely in Irene's head and everything is happening around her. The only lines we hear from Claire are like insignificant comments to people around her um, about, you know, future party plans or a drink she wants. But the your main focus is Irene's head. So um, then let's go to five favorite quotes from the movie. Do you have any favorite quotes, Alexis? I do. I do. Um <laughs> We want cakes, the most beautiful cake you have. <laughs> okay. We want, we want cakes. cakes. I love the way she said it. I can see it. us ordering room service like that. <laughs> Hello, room service. We want cakes. The most beautiful cakes you have. Yeah. That's, that. that's what I want. That one. <laughs> um, it isn't charity work if they pay me. Mm. <laughs> it's like, uh, honey. Okay, this is not charity work, but he didn't want her to do that no how. So he was right. like, you taking a lot of my wife's time. Y'all need to pay her. But mm. that wasn't going to happen. It's not charity work if they pay you. Um, of course, we're all, all of us are passing um, for oh. something or other that one, aren't we? Mm-hmm. So I think that's a fairly true statement. And then um, who's satisfied being anything? So that's my number one favorite quote. You think they'd be satisfied being white, Irene says. And Brian responds, who is satisfied being anything? And then Irene says, I am. Mm -hmm. You think they'd be satisfied being white? Uh, Right. Who's satisfied being anything? I am. Hmm? Satisfied. Is she? Alexis? But <laughs> is she? That's the real question. Is she really satisfied with her life? As Claire comes into her life, I think, you know, she put that on Brian, but I think she questioned her own happiness. Mm-hmm. Like, did she make the right decision? Absolutely. I felt that 100 percent from Irene. I feel like her grabbing Claire's hand at the party and covering Claire's legs when um, she's like enjoying the weather outside. I saw this character as someone so stifled in every way that she doesn't want anyone flying higher than she can dream. Mm. And there are people like that who never want you happier than the happiness they feel they can achieve. Um, So I see her as always pulling Claire back and everything she does 
everything Claire does intrigues Irene and scares her because it's pointing a light at the choices that um, Irene has made. And, you know, because of the time period that they live in, no doubt some of these choices were thrust upon them and they did the best with the cards they had. Um, But Irene has made some choices and I don't think she's satisfied with them. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, And seeing Claire, meeting Claire after all these years is really making her question the choices that she's made and the life she's chosen. Um, And then I love, um, (laughs) can I get you something? That zoo (laughs) annoyed by Irene. I felt that. (laughs) I was like, oh, she got an attitude. (laughs) But but whose side are you on in that room? (laughs) Um, Zoo, because she's fun. She said, what you want? I mean... you brought the groceries in. Could you get out? And why are you asking me, did I clean the kids room? When I get to it, I get to it. I know what happens. This is my routine, lady. She was so annoyed with her. Yes. And this is when I realized Irene is not me. Zoo is me. And I found it hard to be on Irene's side from this moment on because she talks oh. to Zoo as if she's the um, white madam of the house and she's looking down on a lower class member. You know but what I listen, mean? do you remember when um, I, Irene says, it's not that everybody needs help. Remember yeah, when she said yeah, that? Yeah, what was that? Yeah. What was that? But your actions don't display that. Your actions mm-hmm. don't support everybody needs help. You're not treating her. I mean, think if you go back to the garden with them sitting outside and her relaxing and she was like, did you hear me? I called you. Would you mm-hmm. answer when I call you? Mm-hmm. You know, she was like, <gasps> Like offended that she didn't jump up and do what she just said. So, mm-hmm. And Claire's comment was, where did you find someone like her? Someone mm-hmm. who knows some home cooking. And Irene responds, it's not like that. Everyone needs help. Mm-hmm. What girl? What? I just mm-hmm. asked where you found her. Yeah. <laughs> you yep. know what I mean? She took it as a judgment. Why are you so defensive? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So number three oh. on my list of five favorite yeah. quotes is the, the usual, usual problem. problem. All, All these gentlemen, gentlemen of color, of color have driven a mere naughty out of her mind. <laughs> have I laid eyes on her tonight, except in spots here and there being twirled about by some Ethiopian? I have not. <laughs> and that's you looking that, for yeah. his wife at the party. <laughs> Be like, all I seen with her was a spot here and there being twirled around by some <laughs> Ethiopian. <laughs> That's a great line. Yeah, that is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, number four, Irene, watch yourself. Don't find yourself responsible for that kind of happiness. Yeah. So go ahead, please. Exp- I really appreciated those words, but please ex- tell me why I did. I'd like to hear it. So Brian, after Irene muses about how happy Claire was at the party, responds in this way. And I had to pause the movie and like think about that response. What does that mean? Uh huh. Um, so, I mean, what I came to is Claire is happy passing. She's ha- um, not passing. Excuse me. She's happy as a passing woman being brought back into the culture of her family Um, or some of her family members, the black culture. And that's what's making her so happy and making her feel so free. You don't want to be responsible for that kind of happiness because it's dangerous because she could be found out as um, by a white person as being passing. I don't know. So but that's what I came to. So. Irene was claiming Claire's happiness, though, in what way? She's just she, saying she's so happy. I'm actually happy that I invited her because she lights okay. up the room and, and she's just so happy. And then Brian responds, Irene, watch yourself. Don't find yourself responsible for that kind of happiness. So you don't want to be responsible or ju- the idea that you included her in this party and made her that made her. I don't know. I don't get it. OK, <laughs> but <laughs> and I, then like, I was touched by that comment. I just couldn't yeah. figure out. It's probably because of my confusion, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, I love it's just plain, um, it's just plain exoticism and interest in what's different. different. A kind of kind of emotional excitement. Uh, something you feel in the presence of something strange and even perhaps a bit repugnant to you. And there you have it. And this is Irene explaining to Hugh why some white women find black men attractive. But really what Irene is doing is explaining her own attraction to Claire. She's saying this um, woman is interesting because she's different. 
she repulses me. And you can look at um, Irene's face as they're interacting sometimes. And it goes mm-hmm. from love to something motherly mm-hmm. to just repulsion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But she's, she keeps her in her company or yep. kind of. Kind of, she does. Yeah. But then mm-hmm. also, also, I, I'm pretty mad at... Uh, Irene for saying that man wasn't cute because he is for your information. <laughs> yeah, I mean he he was, what? Who was you? He he definitely thought he was till he was end, crying in the snow. I said, he Ooh, was. He stand was. up. You a grown man. Stop crying in the snow. Okay. So <laughs> let's he talk can about- have he can have feelings. Don't try to um uh, say he can't have he can have him sitting down the white man was um sitting down crying mm-hmm. he we, we already didn't respect him <laughs> all right so favorite character in the movie what are your thoughts alexis <sighs> listen brian had all the lines listen lady oh. don't try to molly coddle and i do not know what that word means <laughs> no, i was like should i look it up <laughs> no i'm gonna just let it live in the movie <laughs> exactly exactly i did the same thing i said it fits right there you ain't gonna molly coddle my son one right. and then he said these children need to know about this mm-hmm. and you i mean what is you talking about lady so he re- uh you such a smart woman to be so stupid he said to her so he was really like her um a voice in um trying to stand up for help his wife acknowledge the importance of not ignoring because she could pass and she said at her convenience but she was too comfortable she didn't want her children to be ruffled so he needed to be that voice and I appreciated his voice whenever he came in. Mm-hmm. Uh, except that time when he was like, um, s- nothing wrong with her. She's all right. You know, when he was defending. When he was lying <laughs> about how beautiful Claire was. No, yeah. no, that was oh. fine. <laughs> no, the one you were talking about when he was um, defending Claire. Oh, uh, Claire. when he was defending Claire a little yeah. too strongly. That's too right. strongly. Settle down. Da- settle down. Now you got mm-hmm. a whole a whole wife sitting right here. Okay, <laughs> who don't like her like that? Obviously, although sometimes she do. But you but know, she do. She right do now, like she her. Does. Mm-hmm. She yeah. do like her. You know your wife temperamental. Well, I would say my favorite character is Irene, but I want to put a pin in that and come back to it uh, in our last in the final part of our show. Okay. okay, so let's talk about a favorite. I didn't know how to word this, but backdrop scene atmosphere, something about the set that you loved. What was your favorite part of the set of the movie? Whenever they were outside, whenever they were outside, the scene just when they were walking down the street, Irene and Claire where Claire was walking down the street when they were in the street, when they were in the snow, minus the dead body. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I just love the outside scenes of this um, movie. Yeah. Yeah. Really beautiful. I thought too the um, way Harlem, old Harlem was imagined. Um, I would have loved to sit on the um, stoop and hear somebody play their horn, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was really cool. What about you? I really loved the crack in the ceiling that gets wider as the story progresses. I thought it was a very on the nose reference to possibly the crack in the shell of Irene's life. Like she's living in this glass house or shell that she's created and the crack is getting wider and wider the more time she spends with Claire. I just thought that was a thoughtful detail. So I didn't see that until the second time I wa- well, excuse me, the third time I was mm-hmm. watching the movie. I was like, wait a minute, is that crack getting larger? Right. So I have to go back and see that. It's very interesting. Now, this movie does some foreshadowing a few times. Is there any moment that you can remember that you love? It's probably going to be the same um, as mine. But what's your favorite moment that's foreshadowing something that's going to occur in the movie? Uh, the most standout is when the plant <clears throat> drops. The yes. plant drops out the window. Yep. Mm-hmm. I saw some love for that scene on Twitter, too. Irene drops a pot from the window. Claire looks down at it and asks, should I go down, too? Mm. that That was really good and then there's (laughs) a part where um irene comes down for that first party that they go to and claire compliments her and irene responds thank you but i fear i've chosen all wrong now why did she say that did she because she did look like she was wearing a garbage she had her life (laughs) she did look like she was wearing a garbage bag compared to uh claire but that was the times it was the twenties, right? I don't know. But listen, hers look like a garbage bag, and Claire <laughs> looked like 
you know, fabulousness. Claire looked great. I even <laughs> like that dress she wore, that she changed out of the fancy dress into a more like regular fancy dress <laughs> at the hotel. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I was yes, like, yes. I want that dress. She looks uh-huh. beautiful. She's yeah. almost 40, by the way. She looks great, Ruth yeah, Megan. They does. both do, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. Okay, let's move on to our final part, conjecture. Oh, boy. So let's go ahead and hypothesize and get real crazy. Um, what surprised you about the movie versus the book, Alexis? I don't know. That's for, uh, that's hard to come by. I, 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 nothing stands out to me as truly surprising. Okay. So everything you felt about the characters after reading the book, you felt the same after watching the movie? Mm-hmm. I, I I mean, there's a little time between the book and the reading, but um, I'm going to say, yeah, because I, I and I this is what I felt like. I felt confirmation that it was in the air or so rather or not her husband cheated on her. I feel like they made it stand out clear that it's possible. Irene didn't know what she was talking about, that she had made that all up in her head. And you always take the man's side and I'm always so (laughs) on the woman's side. And this movie made me think, rethink my whole way of looking at life. (laughs) I said, now when you acted out like this, I don't know. I appreciated that because we were only in her head. All every aspect was all hers. It was like, but ain't nobody else speaking. It's any as I'm reading the book, I'm like, is anybody gonna stand up for him? Like he yeah. surely ain't cheating on her. She just made this up and there's no one to contradict contradict her. And she gets to run with that through the story and have everybody believe it. And mm-hmm. there's no basis there's no basis for it. Listen. Ain't nobody cheating on Irene. She's just a weirdo. (laughs) She sent them to the party together to help create a story in her mind about an adulterous affair. She wanted to believe that to help her wrap her mind around why she doesn't respond to her husband. And just because she's not maybe attracted to her husband or she's stifled as far as intimacy is concerned, you can't never be on his side. She ain't never on his side. Mm -mm. In front of his children, she... She ain't mm-hmm. on his side. Even when the police are like, this is what your husband said. She like, nah, nah, that ain't it. <laughs> and it's unnecessary. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> okay, well, not to be on Alexa's side on this. I'm like, can someone be on the man's side for once? <laughs> you could have okay. helped her out there. And say but she wanted her. to blame Claire and not herself for the unhappiness in her marriage. So she was like, why don't y'all go together? And then she like, oh. <gasps> They go in places alone together. <laughs> Girl, you sent them together to the party. It's real people like that, though. Don't forget, it's real people in the world like that. Yes, for sure. And everything isn't intimacy, right? I think Brian found in Claire a fun spirit that is listening to him. Yep. And he was probably happy to go to the party with her. Yep. He knew that he could walk away from her at the party and she would make conversation with other people. If he did come back to her, it would be all jokes and fun. Yep. You know what I mean? Oh, anyway. <laughs> so you got from the um, movie kind of the same things you got from the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I was surprised in a lot of ways. I never thought about Irene getting joy from ha- passing, from playing this role. From um, but what Irene? Made me, yeah, I never thought of Irene uh. getting joy from passing. So we mm. kind of talked about this when we mm-hmm. reviewed the book. But you were like, Irene passes sometimes. And I'm like, yeah, out of convenience, you know, if a place she wants to go to is white only, she's just going to, quote unquote, pass to get in. Um, that to me isn't passing. But. At the beginning of this movie, a woman drops her pickaninny doll, which is a racist stereotype, and Irene bends down and hands it back to her. It was completely unnecessary, Mm -hmm. but she's enjoying playing this role. Mm -hmm. She's completely in it. And then going back to how she treats her maid as a cold um, white lady of the house would, um, Claire comes along and shows you more dignity, complimenting her cooking, um, conversing with her about life, etc. That's not a role... Irene wants to play. So she never, never interacted with Zoo like that, you mm-hmm, know? Mm-hmm. So this may, movie made me think, no, um, Irene likes stepping out of herself and passing. This mm-hmm. is like her fun. 
Yeah, she did. Also, even though even though I still feel like she was uncomfortable doing it, I do think mm-hmm. she was. Um, um, Two things happy can be to true. She, yeah, she can have fun doing it, and sense that there's danger in it too. Right? Is that what you mean? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I also love the contradiction and the fact that Claire is outwardly passing, which is an oxymoron. Um, but Irene is like secretly passing in a lot of ways. Claire is drinking in public. She got her flask and she bringing it out all the time. <laughs> all the time. Meanwhile, Irene is taking hard drugs privately <laughs> and sleeping all day. <laughs> right. Is that what I was to get from that? Irene is taking drugs privately a lot and Wait, sleeping all day. What? She was sleeping all day, but I didn't know there was a drug involved. Girl, yes, there is drugs on the side of the bed, and she's going in and out of consciousness. Oh, I see. I, if I fit, if I watch it a fourth time, maybe I'll catch that because <laughs> I don't remember seeing that. I, was I just like, know man, she was I'm... sleeping all the time. Why? <laughs> I was like, how many ways is Irene passing? And truthfully, she passing in more ways than Claire. Mm -hmm. Claire is passing in one solid way. Everyone (laughs) understands. Irene is doing a lot of passing on a lot of levels. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brian is starved for intimacy. And this movie helped me see that. There's no one in his life concerned about him. The six people need something from him. And I think his hatred for six people is just a hatred for how everyone in his life is he's for them and no one's for him. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. So Claire comes in, she's talking to him. She's listening to him. She brings joy to every situation. And I understand why she, he invited her now to the party that uh, Irene didn't invite her to. I would have invited her also. Ain't no way I'm going to a party with Irene. That don't even sound fun. Yes. Please invite Claire all the time. Oh, you weren't invited. Um, Oh yeah. Come on. She probably forgot. That was a mistake. (laughs) You invited. Please wink, come. Wink. Please come. <laughs> also, uh, dinner at our house every night. Come, please. Help right, me teach these he boys told about the kids. lynchings. He told the kids. <laughs> yeah, she'll be here. I <laughs> hope. <laughs> the kids running in like, Claire, Claire, where's Claire? Oh, hey, mommy. You going to bed again? <gasps> Ooh, that was wild. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. And then, well, let's, let me ask you, d- did John, does John even know if he pushed his wife out the window? What do you think? Um, John is unsure. Um, are are we fully on the question about who did yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. 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 Who did it, Alexis? What happened? There's ambiguity in the book on purpose, but this movie is not ambiguous, right? Oh, you don't, don't feel do you like think? so. No, okay. Okay. I go ahead. Still honestly, don't think Irene did it. I don't. <gasps> I feel Excuse like. Excuse me. I still feel <laughs> like. Okay. It was a lot for her to deal with. I feel like she put her, she gently put her hand to protect Claire and Claire tripped and fell out the window. (laughs) Uh, To me, it's very clear. Is it? That Irene reached that hand out and said, oh, my opportunity and pushed her just a little bit, just enough. You know, Claire didn't weigh nothing but a buck. She pushed it right on out that window. But just so why wouldn't her out. husband stand up and say she did that? She did. He didn't see it. No one saw it. He everyone, was there. He he. Yes. It was the three of them. Him standing here. Claire there. Irene there. <laughs> she, he's coming towards. Oh, he didn't see her arm because he's enraged no. looking at. Everyone is Claire. looking at John. John and maybe Claire's eyes. But they're all looking at John. And so John runs up and Claire falls back. Now, what happened in the middle is unclear. Uh, Claire tripped, you know, over her feet when um, (laughs) when Irene went to kind of protect her and she slipped out the window. That's what happened. Oh, I say that thing that they saying Irene did. She did that. <laughs> she, she pushed her all, right on up out the window. And John don't know if he did it. He can't even comprehend the fact that he was close to this black woman. He he just don't know what to do with himself. He's going to need therapy. And then, so speaking, and then, mm-hmm. and then, yeah. <laughs> Irene is having such a hard time because she had probably had thoughts of this. This time we can't hear her thoughts as we do in the book. She probably had thoughts of it, and to the fact that she actually went out the window, she it blames did, herself. Yeah. So I don't think she did it. I think it was an accident. <laughs> 
at death by misadventure okay <laughs> yeah. oh so great point so there are two endings to the book um and i think you told me about this mm-hmm. in the second ending that's not really published frequently uh the police go back years later and they go to investigate the window and we are to take that to um believe irene will get her just desserts and justice will be brought to her front door eventually. So I love that they took a line from that about death by misadventure. Let's go and look up at that window. But there is no thought in your mind when the movie ends that anyone will ever suspect right. Irene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, She's going to get away with this, but she did it. But not, not right. get away with it, but you know, because you know what? I'm just going to say, I really yeah. loved her reaction. Tessa, the acting? Acting and this part was mm-hmm. so real. The, ooh, ooh, that, I was gonna say when she heaved, when she like dragged, I was like, Tessa girl, did you do it? Yeah. Wait, someone check on Ruth Nega. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was excellent. I was like, yeah. that added bit, that was everything. That was everything. Mm-hmm. So what type of life did Brian and Irene live after the final moment of this movie? What so, do you think? Um, okay, listen. If Brian don't go off to Brazil with his wife, Claire and him not gonna be together. They not no. They not happy. Okay, they is not happy. Mm-mm. Okay, and and um, because people can fall in and out of happiness, but Irene is not the type of person to work to make it happy. She's too busy hiding from who she is to worry about who you really are and meeting you halfway and all that stuff. She's she's gonna be she's gonna make anyone miserable that she's with (laughs) and brian does say i love you as she's crying and so i feel like he would work really hard to help her recover from this because as you said everybody was looking at john um but this emotional trauma that she is experiencing her husband is gonna be there for her so i think he would take this opportunity to encourage her to relocate so she could think differently so this is another you're making me think of this in another way i think they're gonna stay together forever um in this unhappy union and neither of them will change because he's gonna always be missing claire Um, Years later, he's not going to remember whether he loved her in a romantic way. And it won't even matter because she's going to be the break he had in his life. The little bit of happiness in this miserable life with Irene and Irene will forever be passing in so many ways. And she'll just maybe she'll um, overdose or something really sad. Oh, wow. um, Wow. Yeah. And their their children will move away and be the type of kids that never visit their parents. They're going to be so mom. happy to get out that house. Mm, <laughs> I don't know. Because the dad going to change. He gonna, mm. He's going to end up quiet and a shadow of himself. Mm. I don't know. We're really dark. These aren't real people. Okay. So the last question. <laughs> what Oscar will this movie be nominated for and which award will it win? Okay. So you think it's going to be nominated for something? I do. Okay. So... I think one of the actresses could get an award. I think the director or cinematographer could get an award. Yeah, get some I nominations. say cinematography award. But yeah, yeah that they were um, very strong roles. And, and even John Bellew was an outstanding um, character in his own right. But um, definitely the actress should be, actresses should be put up and nominated for some aspect of this movie, the cinematography or director of this. So, yeah. An original screenplay um, or if there's a category for a screenplay um, derivative, I think, of an original IP, I would like to I would guess that Rebecca would win that also Mm, or at least be nominated because although the book exists, she made this movie into her own. Um, So but what about what about um, what happens to Claire's husband after the fall? Yeah, I was thinking about that. And I was like, do I care? So he's going to go into an insane asylum hard oh. stop period. OK, because he couldn't handle what he not learned. And what bothered him more than her death was the fact that he she was of color. Mm-hmm. And that that's what sent him over the edge. I think he snapped inside. It's a wrap. OK, he's going to go back to his family and they're going to secretly put him into an institution. What do you think? I think he's going to send his daughter off to school forever, like never see her again. Because he knows she's got 
um, color in her. Oh yeah, he's disgusted by her his Mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, what happens to him, I I don't know, but I just know he's not going to have anything to do with his daughter after that. Mm, That's a great point. I forget about the daughter. Mm. Wow. All right. Well, that was our review of Passing, the new movie on Netflix directed by Rebecca Hall, starring Ruth Nega and Tessa Thompson. Um, Just so you guys know, we do have an episode coming this Thursday where we are talking about... Our favorite books from season two. Ooh. So if you're new to our show or you are a longtime listener, this is going to be a great episode for you to listen to, to know which episodes to go back and re-listen to. We're going to have a lot of fun. All right. Well, anything else you want to bring out, Alexis? No, but watch the movie a couple more times and share with us <laughs> your thoughts. Tell Kari, let her know that he, <laughs> she did not. Uh, Irene did not kill Claire, okay? <laughs> Let her know. Somebody side with me. Not because I'm, I feel alone, but because I know everybody knows the truth, okay? <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> so until <laughs> next time, readers and watchers, read, read something. something. And maybe watch something too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>